Hey folks, Quilly Team here, and welcome to another episode of our Learning Godot series, where we're trying to remake the classic Asteroid game in Godot as a way to learn the Godot game engine, especially for those of us who are coming from Unity and aren't sure about the differences between one and the other. We're currently on step five. Last episode, we uh, made sure that we are aware of when a collision happens, but currently we're simply writing to the, um, to the console that, hey, I was hit. And actually, I guess we are destroying the player at that point, but we need to do a slightly smarter behavior here. When we die, the player is going to have to respawn because theoretically in Asteroids, we're going to have multiple lives, say three lives. So when we die, if we have more lives left, then we will respawn. And this is going to bring us into the concept of, oh, I didn't mean to move this, uh, the concept of instantiating quote unquote prefabs via code in Godot. Because right now in our scene, we just have a fixed player and a fixed Asteroid in here, which is, which is no good. In usually your workflow in, I'm assuming it's going to be the same Godot, but in Unity, a lot of times you would make turn these GoIM objects into prefabs as quickly as possible because it tended to enable just good and better stuff, and that is certainly the case here. So let's talk about that. Again, to repeat, in Godot, there is no such division between scenes and prefabs. There is just a single type of, of resource called scene, and it always, it, they, they, it serves both, both purposes. Because again, what is a scene and what is a prefab if you're coming from Unity? It is just a file on your computer that holds information about game objects. What is the difference between a scene and a prefab? Well, generally when you're loading a scene, what you're doing first is you're taking everything currently in the world, deleting it, and then loading a brand new fresh series of things from the scene file. Whereas when you're loading a prefab, Generally speaking, you're simply adding it to the world without clearing everything out ahead of time. But if that's the only difference, and I'm sure there's, you know, extra stuff in the file and extra optimization that goes on in Unity, but conceptually, if that's the only difference, then there is no difference. Then scenes and prefabs are exactly the same. And the only question is, before you're loading in this, this scene slash prefab file, are you deleting everything in the world first? So we are going to be converting our player and our asteroid here into scenes. And again, they're going to be effectively prefabs, but they're going to be scenes. And we can do that very conveniently from stuff we've already got going on here. Um, if I go on my player and I right click on the player and we go all the way down here to save branches scene, boop, we're going to make a new scene, player.tscn. We're going to save that. And I'm going to do the same thing with the asteroid. Save branches scene, boop. I'm going to save that. And there you go. So now you can't see the um, the children node of player asteroid because they're part of just the, the basic scene stuff, but they exist as files over here in our file system. If I double click on player, I will open up the player scene and I will see their objects. And that's one of the reasons why when you're creating a new scene, you have the ability to make the root node of your scene absolutely everything. So for example, if we were making a new asteroid and we want to write it from scratch rather than copy something that already exists, our root node of our asteroid would be set to a rigid body, create. So our root node would be a rigid body. I'd probably rename this to something like asteroid dash medium or something like that. But the root node would be this rigid body 2D. And that's exactly what is the case. I'm gonna just go ahead and delete this and not save this scene. There you go. If I open up our asteroid big scene, that's exactly the situation is the root node is a rigid body 2D with some name and that's it. So over in main, we've got these. I can go and delete these. Um, oh, I guess I lost focus, so I couldn't just hit enter. There we go. Um, I can be like, oh, hold on, hold on. We gotta put our player back in. And you know what? Okay, first of all, that was interesting. I dropped the player here. Why is it over here? Well, it's because when I made the player into a, a scene, it remembered its old position. So the base player object over here is centered up. So when I'm dropping into a scene, the origin that I'm dropping it as is over here, the zero, zero point. So it's got this built-in offset. Okay, I don't want that built-in offset. That seems terrible. So here in my player scene, I'm gonna go to my transform and I'm just gonna hit this little thing to reset the position at the zero, zero mark right over here. I'm gonna do the same thing with my asteroid. I'm going to transform, reset the position at the zero, zero mark. Now, uh, and let me save and save. If I check main scene, let me delete this player and just drop it back into the world. And let's say, I'm gonna drop it here. Hey, now it's actually showing up right where I drop it. Cool. And then same thing, if I take this player and let's say I decide to center it up in my scene, which would be 400, 300. There you go. It looks right, no offset, which is great. And I'm just gonna go ahead and drop my multiple asteroids back in. Okay, 
So those are, those are scenes slash prefabs that are working great, but they're not being instantiated by code, which is usually what you want to do. I mean, it's great that things are set up this way. Cause now let's say I decide to make a change to this asteroid. Let's say I decide, you know what, for some crazy reason, I want the collision box to be over here because I'm cruel. If I go over to main, we can see, yep, there we go. That has affected all my prefabs, but obviously I'm going to undo that because that would be nuts. Why would I want to do this? But what I do want to do is instantiate everything through code. So I would like probably the world to start off blank and then have the game go and create these objects on the fly, especially so that it can handle things like respawn and player, as well as generating a new level. So our main node over here in our main scene, I'm going to go and create a script for it. I'm going to call that script main. Seems very logical to me. It's going to inherit from node. Um, it's going to have some default stuff. That's cool. What is this responsible for to do? Well, this is going to be responsible clearly to do something like set up new level, maybe with like num asteroids, because I think as the difficulty gets higher, more and more asteroids will start in the game. They might start with faster movement too. Maybe they need extra hits to kill. I'm not sure what the, I can't remember what the old school difficulty is, but it's gonna have something like that. And presumably this is gonna do something like call um, spawn player and um, spawn, something like four I to num asteroids spawn asteroid. That seems reasonable-ish to me. So we need a function called spawn player and another function called spawn asteroid. All right, that, that seems like a relatively reasonable little structure over here. Uh, oh, you're complaining because we're missing a semicolon or sorry, a colon. Are you okay now? Oh, for I in, not two. There we go. All right, for I in num asteroids, spawn asteroids. So if we set our num asteroids to three, um, I'm going to say in here, I want to call setup new level with num asteroids. I don't like duplicating the name twice. I think I do want this as a property. So, I mean, it's, it's going to correctly check the local as opposed to the self, but I hope that I hate that duplication. So I'll just call this num asked. There you go. I, I, I'm still not happy, but let's just say that's good enough over here. So um, we're going to want to spawn one copy of the player and three copies of the asteroids. So the next thing we're going to need is we're going to need a reference to our player scene and an asteroid scene so that we can instantiate it and add it to our scene over here. And there's a few different ways we can do that. For example, let's say over here in spawn player, I can go and do something like this. Player underscore scene equals load. And then because we're in the GD script built in editor, we get this great little auto completion. Uh, we can go and find a reference to player.tscn. That's our player scene. And we're going to do that. So that's going to load in the scene. And what we want to do is we want to add it, add this new object as a child of main, but we can't do that directly with player scene. I believe, I don't think we'll get a compile error here, but let me just see if I wanted to try add child player scene, if I hit play, we should get an error. And we do because invalid type in function, add child object derived class of argument packed scene is not a subclass of expected yada, yada, yada. What load returns here is an object, a resource called pack scene. Pack scene is not a node that can be added to your scene. It has to be instantiated still. So what we need to do to add the child at this point is we have to instantiate. Now we don't get autocomplete here because load can load all kinds of different resources from your file system. Um, and so without, unless we go ahead and introduce um, type hinting and, and things like that in GD script, um, the, currently, the editor doesn't know that this is a packed scene, so it doesn't know that instantiated is a, vi a viable function call on it, so it doesn't autocomplete it for us. But if we hit play on this, now our player is there. We didn't set a coordinate for it, so it's just showing up at zero, 0, but we've got our player and everything is working as it should. Um, so that's one way to do it. We can do a slight change instead of load. So what this happens right now is every time function spawn player is called, load will go to your hard drive read the file player.tscn and then save it in this variable and then we can do some things with it. 
if this were something where we were spawning many, many, many copies of the same thing over and over, if it had to go to the hard drive and read that every single time, that would be a terrible idea. Let's say we're like our bullet system, right? Or let's say, let's say we're doing like a bullet hell shooter type thing where there's going to be hundreds, if not thousands of bullets on the screen at the same time, constantly loading and doing this. We wouldn't constantly want to load this file over and over. Instead, what we'd want to do if we could, well, first of all, we could cache it, right? I can move this to here. I mean, there's, there's step one. Although I think in theory, this would still run maybe every time, every time I instantiated, um, the main.gd. Now, as it turns out, main.gd will should only get instantiated one. But in theory, depending on what your object is, this could still run multiple times if you keep making new copies of stuff. Um, the whole thing to get to here is rather than load, we might want to use preload. So the difference between load and preload is load runs at runtime every time you get there. So every time we get to the line that says load, it loads the file from the hard drive at that point. Preload actually does a bunch of stuff during the compilation. When the program compiles is when the object gets loaded and gets embedded into your exe. When you start your game, when you run your executable, the preload happens then and there. So all of it ahead of time and just keeps it in RAM. Now, if you had a huge game, like a huge world with lots of different objects, and therefore you were preloading many, 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 many different scenes, not multiple copies of the same scene, but preloading multiple diff different scenes and prefabs and things like that, it would start to eat up more and more and more RAM. So the difference between load and preload is balancing RAM versus loading things from the disk. The game we're making literally doesn't make a difference one way or another, but oftentimes I would say you're probably gonna wanna lead towards preload, um, in most of the situations that you're probably going to interact with as a little indie developer making relatively small scale games, you can probably afford to load everything into RAM ahead of time and then get a little bit more speed. So we're going to preload the player scene over here. Uh, we don't need to do an on right or anything like that. Um, and then over here in spawn player, it's going to be the same thing, player scene.instantiate. As a bonus, because preload is going to be is aware at compile time what kind of object we're loading in, we now all of a sudden get our, our completion. Right? We got our little instantiate um, text completion that we didn't have before because the player scene, we know what player scene is at compile time. So then I hit play, we get the same thing where our player's in the corner, which is probably not where we want it to be. So what we're going to do is we will still instantiate the object here. And then I'm going to say p dot position. Um, actually, I suppose I should say transform. Um, we're not getting autocomplete here, I think, because so my script knows that player scene is a packed scene and can instantiate it, but it doesn't know what the ba base root of this is. It doesn't know that it's a, in this case, a rigid body 2D, uh, which is why it's not giving us the options to complete this, but that's okay. Um, not transform the position. It should be transform.origin. And what I'm going to do is I'm going to set it to, um, get viewport dot size divided by two. And then we will add P to child over here. So this should spawn the player in the middle of the screen. Or now let's set origin transform 2D. Wait, what? You don't want me to set the origin. Presumably I could set origin.x. Are you okay with this? Oh. Well, that's interesting. Ah. All right. I I'll learn me a thing. Okay. There you go. We set the position that way. Done, 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 done. All right. So now we spawn the player in the right spot. That's great. We probably want to do the same thing where we're just caching this viewport. So we're not actually having to call this over and over again. Uh, so I think I'll do the same um, on ready var viewport size is equal to get viewport size. And then we'll just have that cached and ready to go for whatever shenanigans we're doing later on, maybe with the asteroids. All right, so we got that. Uh, so we're gonna wanna, yeah, we're gonna wanna spawn the asteroids as well. So we're, oops, there we go. So this is gonna be, Asteroid big, 
scene. Asteroid big scene done. And then we're going to spawn asteroids here. So we want to do well, basically the same thing we got going on with spawn player. So let's consider that first, right? We've got this, except obviously it's going to be asteroid scene. And uh, I guess I can leave it called P. That's fine. Put on something more generic. A lot of times in Unity, I would do Geo for game object. Uh, I guess we could go N for node. All right, we're spawning a new node. That seems fair. I want to do the same thing here. N. N and N, okay? Um, but we don't want the asteroids to spawn in the center. Instead, we want to spawn probably in a random location on the screen. So I think we'll take a relatively naive approach. For, um, do I? Because let's say we could, for our position, simply um, do something like uh, vector two, where we've got... Uh, Rand randf range from zero to uh, viewport size dot x, right? And then the same thing with y. So these would spawn in a random place on the screen. I don't know if I like that idea because I think I would like the center of the screen to start empty. So instead, I'm thinking we're going to spawn the objects in a radius near the player, but not right on top of the player. I think that seems like a relatively good idea. So um, what I'm going to do is I'm going to write a little function that I have prepped ahead of time for speed here. Do do do. Um, called random unit vector two, which returns a vector two, which is what this is here. In fact, I'll get rid of this because I haven't been doing the typing stuff um, in this code. So we'll leave it there. So this is a function that returns a random vector of length one in some direction. Uh, it is one of the things I do miss in Unity. For some reason, the um, the Godot people are kind of opposed to add more of these sort of like random calls. And I'm a little bit sad about that. Like I, I kind of wish there was a vector two dot like random unit circle or something like that that you could call. But it's okay, we'll just make our own. Um, so what we're gonna do is for our position, we're gonna set a random unit vector. So this thing is going to be a vector of length one in facing in some random um, location. We're going to want it to start in the center of the screen. So we're going to do center of the screen. We're going to offset it by a random unit vector, but this thing is going to be multiplied by a certain size. So here we're going to do um, rand f, uh, rand f range. So it's going to be a random float, and it, we're going to want it to start a certain number of pixels away from the player and within a certain range. So let's set up a couple of variables here. Um, asteroid spawn range min. Let's say no closer than 100 pixels from the player and maybe no further than 300 pixels. We can tweak with these numbers. So let's try that. So from this to max. Okay, that is quite a long line. So let's... So that's the one the one issue with the fact that I've shrunk my uh, my font a little bit. Oh, and we have to put slashes for multi line stuff, don't we? All right, I'll leave it as one line. Um, but, 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 let's see, does this work? What are you complain about? Uh, Operations vector two and vector so vector two i and vector two. Ah, uh, is it because I'm assuming vector size is yeah. So vector si viewport size here is an integer vector two not a floating point vector two. So I have to do the division this way to force it to be a float or um, cast it, um, which I th think in GD script would be this. Think that forces it? Yeah. But anyway, as long as we do the division by a float here, it's gonna come out fine. So every time we run this, spawning the rocks a certain number of spaces away from our ship around in theoretically a random location. It's weirdly clustering them. There you go. Kind of like that. Now, I think we'd probably in the end actually want code to like spread them out in a more even way rather than pure randomness, but this is a reasonable way to start and that's going to be okay. 
Um, the other thing we can do is give the asteroids a bit of a movement when they spawn in. So we got two places we can do it. We can either do it in the asteroids code or we can do it in the um, the main function. When it generates the asteroid, we can give it a little initial velocity. Let's let's just put in the asteroids code over here. We don't need anything processing, but in the ready pass over here, I propose what we're going to do is we're going to apply a force um, in a random direction. Hey, wait a minute. You know what would be a great function for my random direction is if we could use the random unit vector code a second time. That's true, me. Um, so what are we going to do? Well, we're clearly going to copy and paste that into Asteroid Big so we have access to it. No, that feels bad. That feels really bad. And then we have two copies of random unit vector. What's the solution? The solution? Well, I propose what we do is we make a new script that we call our, um, I don't know, our utility script. Right? A utility script. And we're not going to have it, let's open this up. We're not going to have it extend anything, which does actually make it extend like, um, I think resource or something like that internally, but we don't need to extend anything. This is just going to be a script. We're going to have to give it a name so we can refer to it other places. So we're going to call it utility like this. And it's going to have a function that is static. So this can be called without actually ever creating an instance of utility. It's just going to be a static function that returns this vector to. And so what I'm going to do in, um, in our main over here, I'm going to remove this function and instead just call utility dot random unit vector. And then I can do the exact same thing over here in our asteroid. So we'll have, um, some sort of const, um, starting force equals, uh, I don't know, so, some amount 300. Uh, and actually, I don't want to apply force because this is going to be a one-time shot, not something frame to frame. So I want to apply an impulse. So a one-time impulse, which is going to be utility dot random unit vector multiplied by, we could multiply the starting force, but then all the rocks would move at the exact same speed all the time. So instead what I'll do is I'll do rand f range where the amount is going to be somewhere between starting force divided by two or starting force multiplied by two. So if we run this, all right, that's way too strong. Let's cut it by a th down to a third. Okay, that's not bad. Now again, there's gonna be a range of these. So we might run super, roll super high or roll super low. That one is clearly on the lower side, but that seems fairly reasonable. I think we're gonna finally do something about the size of our ship. Our ship's too big. I think the rocks might be good, I might actually want the rocks to be bigger. What I'm going to do in our prefab, I'm going to take our player prefab sprite. And I think I'm just going to go um, transform. I'm going to scale it down to like half, 0.5. These are linked by default, so it'll do the same. And then I'm going to uh, change the size of our collider here. Uh, what's great is you can do math in these. So I can do 35 divided by two and it'll set it to 17. Look at that. I don't even have to count. Oh, wonderful. Um, our asteroids, yeah, I think the asteroids should be bigger. So transform. Um, yeah, I'm going to make them twice as big. And then for the circle shape. Okay. Might have gone too far on both counts. I don't mind the ship size, actually. But these are definitely way too big. Let's do 1.5. So times two thirds. There we are. And then yeah, for the player. Um, oh, we got this right. I could have just changed the player scaling, but I don't like doing that. I like to keep the root player objects and things like that always at the default base scaling, because if you do anything else that applies scaling, then you could like muck up your stuff. That way you could expect your base objects to always have a scale of one. So if you apply an effect that's supposed to shrink them or grow them mid game, you can do that. Let's go to like 0.75 maybe. All right. I think I like this. That feels pretty nifty to me. So right now, when we whack an object, we are dying. Note that um, our asteroids, the first asteroid will be called asteroid, but after that, because you can't have two objects in your scene with the exact same name. So after that, the subsequent spawns are just going to be named after, presumably, I guess, their, their base type 
and then getting a number. So rigid body 2D at two. We probably had at one and at two or at two and at three, depending on how it counts. Okay, so the player is correctly dying. Um, how does it come back to life, right? What does it mean? Well, I say it's this. When the player dies, we should simply respawn the player. We'll obviously want to check, you know, number of lives and things later on. But for now, we're just going to want to respawn the player when it dies. So let's set up some connections. Let's set up some listeners over here. We are going to... We're going to do it through code as well. I'm going to create an event listener on player death. Yes, I like it. Um, and more importantly, in player, so this is our, well, sorry, this is changing prefabs. I actually don't need these prefabs open. Although it's convenient that the switching from scene to scene does change to a different selected um, script, depending on what you had left, left over there. <clears throat> I'm going to say for my player, I'm going to make a custom signal um, called um, has died. I like that. And then over here, when the player was hit, we're going to say, um, we're going to emit the has died message. What was me? We are dead. And then we're going to want to listen to that. So over in main, over here, whenever we spawn a player, we are going to want to connect to the has died event. And we're just going to want to put in our listener over here. When the player dies, we're going to go ahead and remember that that has happened. All right, let's go and make sure we get a message about this. That is current, correctly working. So player gets hit by a rock. Player died, indeed got reached. So we've got a couple of debugs things. We've got the player responding to the fact that it was hit. And then over here, that the player has died. So at this point, the player is already despawning itself. That, that's been handled by itself. It is going away. What we need to do is we need to respawn the player. So we can just go ahead and do this. Now, currently spawn player gets called when we load a new level. Like, like if we kill all the asteroids, right? That we've cleared the level. We're going to start a new level. So we're going to run set up new level again, which does spawn a player. I propose that what should happen at the start of every level, we should in fact despawn the old player and create a new copy of the player at that point. Um, and what should happen when a player spawns in, we should give it a couple of seconds of invulnerability, right? Both if we just died and then come back to life, we don't want the player to instantly die again because it's not fun. But also it's unpredictable what motion the asteroids are gonna have at the start of the game. Theoretically, an asteroid could be moving directly towards the player. Now we could write code to avoid that, but it might end up with our asteroid movement looking artificial. So if we just give the player a couple of seconds of invulnerability at first, they'll have time to move out of the way, you know, in theory. We'll see, there's different ways we can balance it, but that's gonna be what I'm gonna say. And on spawning a new level, it's gonna be the same thing. So I propose actually that with the player here is maybe the player shouldn't delete itself over here. Maybe what we should do, get rid of that, just say, you know, we'll admit the has died thing, but the player won't do anything else. Instead, our main script over here, right? Player died, spawn player. We're gonna go and keep a copy of the, uh, the player. And have a player node. Yeah, I mean, I don't have to say null because that's what it's going to start up at, 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 anyway. But what's going to happen over here is we are actually spawning a new copy and storing in the player node. And first we're going to say, if player node, then q uh, player node dot q free. If there's already an existing player, which is the case that's going to happen if we are loading in a new level, and the old player still has to be removed. We're going to remove the old player. And then we're still going to instantiate a brand new player node over here and store it. So now what should happen when we die? Whoa. Okay. That was a little crazy. Was well, the player colliding with itself? Because it hasn't fully despawned yet. I think that might be exactly what was happening there. You move out of the way and then die over here. Oh, it is still there. Mm -hmm. Why is this not running? Oh, 
Oh! Because I'm making a local player node, which is what's getting set. So the player node that belonged to the base class was never being set. That's why. If we were in a different um, uh, IDE, we would have gotten a warning here that we were um, overriding like a class property with a, a local function. Now, if we do this, there we go. We did die multiple times right there, which is no good. Boom. 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 There. Now things are working brilliantly and beautifully. Excellent. All right. No, that's great. That seems exactly perfect. I mean, we don't have the invulnerability frames or anything yet, but we've got uh, the respawning and everything going on. So we are here. Player death respawning. Spawn prefabs via code. That's looking great. Next episode, we're going to shoot stuff. We're going to blow up some rocks. Folks, thanks a lot for watching another episode. As always, uh, like, comment, subscribe, do all those things. That, like, I can't tell you how much of a difference it makes on YouTube. You know, it's annoying to hear, but like, YouTube is annoying. <laughs> That's the way it goes. Thanks for watching. I'll see you next time. Bye-bye.